Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 50 of the Fair Housing Insiders. I'm your host, Jonathan Saar, and joining me today is Leslie Tucker from Williams, Edelstein and Tucker. So we're looking forward to having an amazing conversation about verification forms and how there's not a one size fits all when it comes to your verification form. So can't wait for her commentary and her feedback on, on this particular topic. Housekeeping reminders, please, if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our newsletter. That way you never miss out on an episode. Um, you can also subscribe to the YouTube channel. And if you like shorter content, we post a lot of fair housing related tips and topics on our Instagram account. So you can follow us there at Fair Housing Institute. So Leslie, we've had you on the show many times before. I'd like to welcome you again. How are you doing? I'm great, Jonathan. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, it's nice to have you. And congratulations on the recent launch of the e-commerce portion of your website on fairhousingfirm.com, where you have a lot of uh, templates available for, for verification forms. So it's nice that we get to talk about that today. And, and I liked your, your comment before we started uh, recording this. You know, that, that's one of the challenges that you see is that sometimes property management companies will just default to a generic form. So let's get into some, some talking points and we'll see uh, by the end of this show, everyone, why you should not have just a one size fits all form by any stretch of the imagination. So Leslie, what are verification forms and why are they used? Well, verification forms are used typically after management receives a request for a reasonable accommodation or a modification uh, to kind of verify whether someone is disabled under the definition of in the Fair Housing Act and whether they truly need this particular accommodation or modification and, and why. Um, a lot of times and most of the time, the need or the disability status or both is not obvious just from talking to the person or looking at the person. So verifying that information with a third party professional is a lot of times necessary in order to you know, determine whether you should approve the request. Very good, thank you for that. So uh, is it necessary? Like does a, does a community, a property management company, do they have to use verification forms? So, no. I mean, the answer is no. You don't have to. There's no rule that says you have to. Um, you can approve all requests that you get if you want. I don't necessarily advise doing that. Um, you know, it's really uh, recommended that you have an established process for how you process each and every reasonable accommodation request. And it's recommended that forms be part of that process. Um, you know, one situation where maybe a form would not be involved is if you got a request and then someone provides their own doctor's letter or some, you know, or a letter from a therapist or some sort of third party professional. Um, and so they kind of beat you to the verification process by providing you with a letter, for example. Um, so if you get a letter and it has all the information in it that you need to make this decision, then you wouldn't need to use a form. Um, but a lot of times the process doesn't happen like that. A lot of times the request is made verbally or an email is sent. Um, and in, you know, in which case you would bring in your forms into the process to, to verify the request. Um, I think you know the other situation that you would use your forms is if you do get a letter or some sort of note from someone's healthcare provider and it doesn't have the information in it. Um, it's, it's vague, it's brief. It doesn't have information about someone's disability status or why they might need this accommodation. That's another situation or another scenario where you would kind of bring in your forms into the process and say, look, I didn't get the information that I needed in that letter. Right. I'm going to need to use my form and follow up with your 
your healthcare provider. So those are the kind of the two situations that you would use a verification form in. Excellent. Yeah, thank you for that explanation. So uh, are there any issues that can, can come up when you're processing verification forms? Uh, absolutely, yeah, all the time. Um, and these issues keep me busy on a daily basis. <laughs> um, so, so one of the major issues that can come up when processing verifications is, um, you know, possibly finding out or, I guess, suspecting that someone's verifier um, doesn't know them very well, <laughs> isn't necessarily reliable. Um, and, and doesn't really have the information that they need in order to make a recommendation as to their disability or, you know, their disability related need for the, you know, the accommodation or modification. Those are tough situations. Uh, it's, it's pretty common though that, uh, that a housing provider might suspect that they're getting an unreliable verification. If you do find yourself in that situation, I think it's probably best to consult with an attorney um, before taking further action on those types of verifications because, you know, that can get hairy. Yeah. Um, the, the other situation is kind of one that I, that I referenced earlier, which is, um, you know, you get a letter, it has some information in it, not really the information that you need, so, you know, some, some uh, housing providers feel like they have to accept anything that's given to them as verification. And if it, you know, if that doesn't have the information in it that you need, which is A, it confirms the disability status of the person. This person is disabled under the definition in the Fair Housing Act. And B, this person has a need that's disability related for this specific accommodation. So those, those pieces of information are what you're looking for. And if you get a letter or a note from a healthcare provider and it doesn't have all that information in it, you then need to kind of go back to the, the applicant or resident and say, I'm sorry, you know, this letter isn't sufficient. I need to follow up with this verifier and ask some additional questions. Um, you know, it's important that you receive the requester's signature as authorization to contact that healthcare provider. You can't do it without their permission. Um, so that's an, that's an important step that you cannot miss. And then kind of finding out what, what, what further questions do I need to ask to, you know, get to the information that I'm looking for. Um, you can do that with a, an email, you can do it with a, you know, a letter that you just type up, or you can use a form um, that you just have kind of in your, in your files that you can use as a follow-up. Um, and I think that it's really helpful to have some, uh, to have some forms in your files that are established for certain purposes or let's say parking requests, and let's say animal requests, right. uh, transfer requests. These are really common types of, of accommodation requests that, that housing providers receive every day. So it's really helpful and time-saving to have those already in your files so you can reach in and send those, those forms out when you need them. Yeah, yeah, very good. Thank you for sharing those examples. That was kind of like my train of thought, just hearing all of that explanation you know, that was at the beginning where we were talking about how some feel, well, if I just have this form, it should cover, you know, check all these boxes for all these different types of situations. But that definitely can create a lot more challenges and a lot more problems for a property manager and for the company itself if they if they go down that route. Because there's just, like you said, there's just so many different situations where you have to get you know, verification, like, you know, you, you mentioned parking and there's assistance animals, live-in aid, uh, allergies. And, you know, there's, right. a, there's, a, there's a lot of different things that, you know, people may be making requests for. And so having different forms, you know, that meet, um, you know, that discuss that particular item makes it a lot easier for, for you as a management company. 
Okay, so we've talked about you know some challenges that may come up when you're processing verifications. Any tips or best practices that you could share with our audience about forms and verifications? Um, I think a best practice is um, just within your procedure, uh, once you send a verification form out to a verifier, don't just sort of let it, you know, go off into the wind. <laughs> Make sure that you are doing your due diligence. If you don't receive it back within, let's say, a week, follow up with that verifier mm -hmm. at least once. I think, um, you know, as long as you follow up once with the verifier to see, hey, did you get this form? Should I expect it back anytime soon? Do I need to send it again? Just that's going to be necessary to show that you are engaging in this process and trying to move it along as opposed to just sending it out and sitting back on your hands and letting time pass. So I think that's really important. And that's something that is gonna be looked at if uh, a resident files you know, a complaint with HUD saying that there was this delay in my accommodation request and all of that. So you wanna be able to show that. Um, keeping good records regarding what's going on in the process. Uh, if, you know, if you have conversations with the resident or applicant about their request. Um, if you make alternative suggestions regarding maybe something um, that they're not thinking of that might meet their needs, mm -hmm. make sure all of that is documented really, really well. Um, and I think as far as another you know, best practice for forms is if you have a verification form, in your files, if your company just kind of has a verification form and it's generic and it says, you know, does this person meet the definition of disability? Does this person need, you know, this fill in the blank accommodation? Sign your name, thank you. You know, a lot of companies that I've come across have forms that look just like that. Right. And they send them out for every single type of request. And they don't ask any other questions. And it's just, um, it's just so easy <laughs> for a verifier to check kind of both boxes and have that be the end of it when you don't need to make it that easy. Um, it's within your right to get information and get reliable information um, and it doesn't have to be that easy. So I would highly recommend if you don't already have customized forms for some of your common requests, like Jonathan was saying, allergies, um, change in flooring, transfers, reserve parking. Um, you know, th I think there are a lot of different questions that you should ask in regards to some of those requests that just any old generic form wouldn't contain. Um, for example, let's just take, um, let's take allergies. Someone says, well, you know, I'm allergic to my carpet, so mm -hmm. I need hard flooring. Um, so, you know, in your verification form, you can ask, has this person been tested for allergies? Um, which of those substances that they're allergic to are located in their carpet. <laughs> um, you know, it's not always obvious and sometimes the resident doesn't know for sure. Um, so asking a verifier these, these further questions can be really helpful in getting a, a more considered um, and thorough recommendation. Um, you know, you could ask, you could, you could even give the, inf the information, give some information to the verifier, like, like for example, you know, are you aware that this resident has two cats? Could this potentially contribute to the you know, reaction that they might be having? You know, so this is all relevant information um, mm -hmm. that the verifier may or may not even have. So I think it's fair game and um, customizing your forms for every you know, situation is gonna help you kind of get to the root and get to the bottom and get a, a, a 
you know, thorough and, and um, right. complete recommendation from the Ab verifier. Absolutely. Less room for error when you have something that's there, it's straightforward and mm -hmm. it puts less pressure on the uh, property manager at that community too, I'm sure, just to be able right. to say, you know, this, we need to have this filled out. So yeah, excellent explanation. I think anyone who's listened to the show is going to take a look at if they have a one size fits all form and, and rethink whether that's a <laughs> rethink whether that's the best practice or not. So thank you for for those explanations, uh, Leslie. So we're going to look at a scenario now, and uh, I'm going to bring up on the screen here, uh, Leslie, a a generic letter, and let's let's take a look at it, uh, see you know, your take on it, what's wrong with it, and, you know, what, what you would do about it if you got something that was as vague as a letter like this. So let's take a look and we'll, we'll, we'll get your comments on it. Sounds good. So here's the, here's the vague letter, Leslie. What are, your, what are your thoughts on the content? This letter is a really good example of uh, letters that I see from clients all the time. Um, physicians or, you know, other kinds of healthcare providers, they don't always know exactly what is supposed to go in these letters or how much information to give. A lot of times they're very brief, they're very vague. In this specific example, um, it, the letter references a medical condition. And again, I, I see this a lot. Um, uh, certain, you know, conditions or ailments, mm -hmm. um, that doesn't necessarily mean that this medical condition constitutes a disability under the Fair Housing Act. We all have medical conditions, we all have ailments, but that doesn't mean that we're necessarily all disabled. Uh, so this language used, uh, medical condition, is not sufficient in order to determine that this person is disabled. Another thing that sticks out to me in this letter is that the physician says that this person would benefit from a unit transfer. Reasonable accommodations and modifications have to be necessary, not just beneficial, um, not just preferable. Um, it has to be absolutely necessary because of someone's disability. So the language used in this letter, benefit from, um, enable her to sleep better. None of this is, is showing me um, that this transfer is necessary because of a disability. So if I got this letter as a manager, I would definitely follow up with this physician or whatever, whatever medical professional this is mm -hmm. to ask more questions um, and to get kind of more information on the inf on the disability status and the need. I think you would absolutely be justified in doing so. Right. And I'm sure justified in having them fill out a form of some sort. <laughs> right. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, Leslie, it's that time where we give you five questions or fair housing fast five and see if you can answer all five of these questions in under one minute. And if you win, you know, you might get a cruise to the moon or to Mars or Jupiter or something. That's our, that's our prize offering for today for anybody who gets under, under one minute. Our that's a great incentive, Jonathan. Yeah, Thank yeah. You. Famous, fictitious, you know, <laughs> prize winnings, you know, this isn't Jeopardy. We don't have anything really real, but this is a lot of fun to ask these questions and see if we can get them under five minutes. So are you ready? I'm ready. All right. Can a landlord require the use of its forms? No, not technically. It's the use of forms is strictly just recommended. Is a landlord allowed to ask follow-up questions of a verifier? Yes, if a verifier doesn't initially give all the information needed to make the, de the decision, you can ask follow-up questions. Does a tenant have to authorize a landlord to contact her verifier? Absolutely, 100%. You can't contact the healthcare provider without authorization. What are two benefits of using a verification form? 
uh, keeping consistency in your process for processing reasonable accommodation requests and uh, being able to customize and ask uh, questions that are relevant to the request. Where can I get verification forms? Uh, you can create your own, and which is difficult, or uh, you could go to fairhousingfirm.com and order some from that website. Very good. That was that was actually really really close, Leslie. So a minute and Did five seconds. It? Minute five. Oh right. Yeah. So <laughs> you came that close to a trip to Jupiter. So well oh, done. Man. Very well done. That was awesome. Awesome. A uh, great topic. So thank you again for providing some insight. So key takeaway, uh, avoid generic forms, use the proper forms. It will make your life a lot easier. So we really appreciate your commentary and providing our community with that insight. So again, congratulations on your new online store at fairhousingfirm.com. You want to tell our audience a little bit about what's available on that store? Uh, on... On uh, my firm's website, we are offering um, some already pre-customized verification forms and request forms uh, for some common types of requests like uh, parking and assistance animals um, and allergies and, and things like that. So it, there are some you know, questions that are already kind of pre-filled that apply to a lot of these different situations. Um, so they're, you know, they're available for you to uh, purchase and you can you know further customize them based on whatever you know scenario you happen to be going through um, but the the meat and potatoes are there already for you to use there's also some uh, some sample policies um, that are useful for a lot of different communities as well so I would I would recommend checking it out yeah absolutely yeah thank you for sharing this a uh, little overview so fairhousingfirm.com so we'll make sure that's in the show notes. And if you're in need of forms, yes, please check that out. So again, thank you, Leslie, for sharing your, your experience, your insight on this topic for today. And for our community, thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing uh, this, uh, this show, this episode with your team, with your network. Uh, keep in mind that we, we have episodes coming up in the, uh, in the future where we address your questions. So if you have uh, questions and you're interested in possibly winning a $250 uh, prize, please submit your questions on any of our YouTube episodes. We keep track of them. And so at a future episode, when we're addressing community questions, um, you could be a, a random a winner for just submitting those questions. We appreciate your support. Thank you for being here today. If you have any other topics that you would like us to discuss, please feel free to reach out to us, direct message us, and we'll be happy to consider them. So thank you again. Until next time. Take care, everyone.